Uh, my name is uh, Liraz Siri, and this is Dror uh, Tirosh. <laughs> I know your name. <laughs> and we've been working on account abstraction in various forms for a few years now. And uh, Yoav Weiss, who is not here, is from the Ethereum Foundation, and he has been our colleague. And um, yeah, we're working on this in collaboration with uh, Nethermind. And uh, originally, um, we were working um, as the OpenGSN team on meta transactions and all of it kind of merged into um, account abstraction, ERC-4337 standard. But we're gonna talk about um, how account abstraction is generally useful, regardless of the implementation. So uh, let's talk a little bit about accounts in Ethereum. So right now, the default account, well, the, what you get is an externally owned account and it is a one size fits all EEC DSA key. And the other option you have, if you um, if you want to have um, like your own smart contract, that would be controlled by code, but you would still need an EOA to interact with it. Probably your current wallet is an externally uh, owned address. There are some limitations with that. The first one is maybe some of us have gotten used to it by now, but key management can be hard. And there's a little bit of a paradox with key management intrinsically because there's a secret that you're on one hand trying really hard not to lose, because if you lose it, you can't do anything with your account anymore. Uh, and when you don't want to lose something, what do you do? Well, you create many copies of it, and you make sure the copies don't get lost. Um, but on the other hand, you also don't want the key to be stolen. And when you don't want something to be stolen, what do you do? You, you know, try to hide uh, it from uh, adversaries, uh, make it really hard to access, uh, many minimize how many copies there are to be stolen in the first place. And the engineering strategies, when you just have this one uh, key that you're trying both to prevent from being stolen and from being lost, they're kind of um, mutually exclusive or they, they pull in different directions. So key management is hard even if you know what you're doing. The other big limitation of EOAs is just access control. Whether you're just uh, playing a blockchain game or you're a multi-billion dollar corporation, if you're using an EOA, it's, it's like the same access control policy. Um, so that's very limiting. You don't have uh, granularity. Um, you wouldn't have multi-sig support. There's no ability to implement roles. Um, you can't have spending policies. It's just one size fits all uh, mechanism based on this access to a secret key. The other big limitation of EOAs is gas payment. So you're paying gas directly from the EOA and it has to be an ETH the native token. Um, now, potentially there are many other ways that you might want to be paying gas if you hold some, you know, if you're a fan of dog coins, maybe you want to pay gas in that, you don't want to hold ETH. Um, and uh, the other lim big limitation is that, well, if you do have to maintain an ETH balance in every account, it's hard to split up your activity between a lot of accounts because then you have to top off ETH and all of the accounts and the ETH that you top off, it has to come from somewhere that's probably attached to your identity. I mean, you maybe KYC at exchanges um, and our identity is known to at least some players and then, yeah, it's not too hard to track and even if we split up activity, oh, this is all coming from one source. So that's a privacy problem. The other big limitation of EOAs is just in terms of efficiency. Um, many times, what you actually want to do, uh, it um, spans more than one transaction. So let's say you want to approve, um, approve, and then you want to transfer. Those are two transactions, but um, really, you 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 are thinking of them as one operation. With EOAs, you would have to send two separate transactions, and um, you know that that might not work out. Um, it also might be a little bit more expensive uh, because of that, but there's no automicity um, uh, built in. And if there is a revert on chain, that's pretty expensive. Um, so, and that happens sometimes, especially with things that are very time sensitive. So what is the alternative? What is account abstraction? Well, basically what we're saying is, you know, EOAs are, um, they're the one size fits all past. And we wanna move beyond them to a world where um, we can really manage the logic uh, that controls our account and the logic can be pretty arbitrary. 
Um, and then that opens up a lot of possibilities. And that is the future of how accounts are going to work. So what are the use cases for this? Um, you know, the one that's been talked about since the beginning is social recovery. Like let's say something bad happens um, to that secret that you're trying to both prevent from being lost and from being stolen. Well, maybe you have some friends that you plugged into your account and three out of five of them can help you uh, restore uh, your wallet. Um, and you can do even fancier things. Let's say your friends suck and uh, they're trying to steal your money. Well, you could have a delay mechanism built in. So if your friends suddenly try to recover your wallet when you don't need a recovery, you as the account owner uh, would see that in advance and the operation wouldn't uh, happen immediately. So you would have time, let's say maybe a week uh, to respond to that. The other really interesting use case is a dead man switch. Nobody lives forever, unfortunately. And then what happens if, um, what happens if you know, you, um, you need to, to pass on um, your, your crypto, but you're not around to, to help do that. So with the dead man switch, you could have a mechanism like, okay, if you haven't accessed your account from your main key for the last year, then an, um, another key that um, your family members have access to, um, they, they, it would become active. So usually you're in control, full control of your account, but then a year later, you haven't been active, something wrong happened, uh, your account automatically passes to a multi-sig controlled by your family. Uh, just one thing I, I want to explain, uh, these are all features of that account abstraction can give, but it, it's not that everything is come fully baked in. Either account abstraction, account abstraction opens uh, the door for wallet creators to add all those features. None of those features are something that will be on day one, maybe a limited set. These are options that are open to do more. Oh, now we, we can both talk even if uh, we can talk over each other if we need to. Okay. Uh, that, that's a good point. I was talking to you all about that uh, when we were preparing for the talk. Um, this is, oh yeah, maybe, maybe that would be nice. So that's a really good point. Um, this talk is intended to inspire, hey, like we can do these things now, um, that we have this, um, this infrastructure built in. But um, this all depends on the code that's running um, your, your, your smart wallet account. And that's up to wall developers, that's up to uh, anyone that wants to get involved. And uh, most likely there are many use cases um, that are interesting that will not be covered by this talk. So use, you know, the, the sky's the limit in terms of imagination. Um, but we would like to talk about some of the use cases that we've been thinking about. So one of the cool things that happened uh, during ETH Bogota is there was a project that implemented an idea that we've um, uh, been thinking would be pretty cool is, um, well, there's, there's this uh, signing mechanism in most mobile phones. The problem is the signing mechanism doesn't support ECDSA curves. So it's, it's, it's using some other me uh, mechanism. Um, but because account abstraction doesn't lock in ECDSA as the only way to sign, what you can do is you can have pair device keys um, that essentially, you know, you get your phone and you link your phone to your account. Now your phone uh, can authorize uh, operations on your account. Um, and, and a team actually implemented that in the recent hackathon, which we thought was pretty cool. Multisig is a very obvious use case. So, you know, now um, you would be able to just um, uh, get that out of the box. Um, another one is BLS aggregation, which requires a little bit of explanation. Uh, BLS is a mechanism to aggregate signatures. Um, and that's cool because it reduces your gas costs. And because we have the ability to implement any signature verification mechanism in the account, then now we can have more efficient uh, uh, signature validation and save some costs. Uh, the other big one is eventually, we know that the signature mechanisms that we're using are going to be broken. It's only a matter of time. Quantum computing is making uh, significant progress. It's no longer theoretical. The qubits are getting up there eventually. We will 
all have to stop using EC ECDSA. Uh, but there are alternatives. Um, and hopefully by the time this becomes you know, a pressing problem, we will just be able to use um, any quantum resistant signature mechanism um, that we want, that is maybe like gas efficient and secure. Um, and you can, you can swap that. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility once you abstract away how you do signatures and it's not hard, hard coded. So um, other interesting use cases are spending limits. I mean, you know, if, you, if you're using your wallet for small day-to-day -day things, maybe you're paying for coffee, uh, for a meal or for something, you know, um, uh, that is not usually life-changing, then it makes sense for that to be something that you can do very easily. Um, that shouldn't be too hard. But then if you're making, you know, very big investment, um, then you want, you, you might want to add, uh, add like a more, uh, secure way of doing that. So you go get your ledger, um, really depending on, on what is the spending limit that you're comfortable with for different levels of security. Uh, and you can, you would be able to implement that because again, you can have arbitrary logic inside, um, inside a contract that is controlling your account. Um, the other cool thing that you can do is, well, you can have, you can have uh, different roles and you can delegate specific actions uh, to those roles. So, you know, if you're, if, if the account is a corporate account, you can give uh, payroll uh, authorization um, to people who are in charge of that. And um, you can specify the spending limits. Um, another example would be, if you're, you know, if you're, um, uh, you have a legal department, or, or you just want to delegate voting power for certain tokens, you could do that in a way that still limits your exposure, just to that. Um, so they would be able to vote with the tokens, perform governance actions, but not, you know, like transfer the tokens, for example. Um, and uh, usually in companies, I mean, this is something that's very common in corporate bank accounts. You give, you give different uh, roles in the company, different powers. So, you know, the CFO might be able to uh, transfer a larger sum, but there's still a 24 hour delay. Um, and then, you know, maybe other C-level executives could, could veto that if maybe the, you know, the CFO's key was hacked. Uh, or their computer um, was hacked, or the CFO is untrustworthy for some reason. But um, another example would be, well, you you want you want to uh, give an auditor um, the power to monitor uh, payments, and then the auditor has responsibility if if something you know they have the responsibility to reach out to authorized parties and then verify that what they're seeing happening on chain is what is supposed to happen. So this way you can have like maybe like a third party accounting firm, um, maybe the one you already work with, say, hey, like, you know, we, we owe it to our shareholders that our treasury management um, doesn't get compromised. And how about like we plug you into um, our our treasury in a way where, yeah, you can't, you can't perform. You don't have to rely on maybe your computer security or, or your staff. We don't have, we want to, we don't want exposure from to them in terms of being able to, um, to transfer funds, but we do want to give you the responsibility of whatever you see happening, you know, talk to the people who are in charge, make sure that it is an authorized action. And, you know, within this delay limit, uh, if it isn't, just veto it, just like cancel the transaction. So you could give them the power to cancel, but not initiate transactions. And um, I think the one that's going to be like very useful very soon is uh, session keys. So uh, in fact, uh, I think this is something Argent recently implemented for, um, uh, for their uh, uh, Stark, StarkNet uh, wallet. So the idea is, well, you want to play some blockchain game. And you don't want to have to, to click approve every time, like a message needs to be signed. That, that would really, you know, uh, distract from the gaming experience. But you also don't want to give uh, this, this game 
full power over your wallet, that would be crazy. Like, you know, what if there's a security uh, bug in the game? So ideally, you want to create a session key, and the session key has the ability to do whatever is needed, but limited to the gaming contract, nothing else. And then the worst thing that can happen is, I don't know, maybe you're like, your, your game sword, your NFT items are stolen uh, if the game gets hacked, but everything else is safe. Um, and you could you could just store this this key inside your browser. Um, so as soon as you you authorize this, as, soon as you generated the session key, um, from that point onwards, you're not even uh, you don't have to be in the loop in terms of authorizing transactions, and it just becomes transparent. So that that's a really nice that's a really nice one. Um, with well, session keys, also you, you could you can mix you can mix um, what we were talking about before. So you could have a session key not only has maybe limited access um, to uh, to a specific contract, but you know maybe you have multiple devices and you want very easy things uh, to be uh, like very not not, not secure things uh, things that are not very high, uh, risky um, to be very easy from your computer. So um, maybe if you just want to sign into an event or, or um, you know, something that doesn't have world-changing implications, if your computer gets hacked, so you authorize your browser, um, and you you would still you you know you would still um, have have control um, over your account in case something goes wrong. Browsers are not the most secure platforms, um, but you could just limit how much power the browser has. Uh, over your assets. So um, there's also a big UX issue with gas, where you know the traditional Web2 um, world, where most of our users will be coming from, uh, gas is not really a concept. So if you have a, a server, you're not really thinking about who's paying to run the server, and uh, how do I share in the costs? It just somehow works uh, behind the scenes. And users who are new to the space will not be really familiar um, with the concept of gas. And it's also a hassle even for people who are familiar. So with, with uh, abstract accounts, um, you, can, you can have a lot more flexibility in how you handle this. So for example, if you're a game, um, especially if you're running on a cheap, uh, cheap uh, layer two, you could decide, hey, it's worth, worth just subsidizing the transactions uh, as part of my um, onboarding process, um, it's very common to to have to um, like um, budget some amount in order to uh, acquire users. Uh, so if it's not prohibitively expensive, maybe you want to do that, and then you know later um, uh, that's worth your while. Um, another uh, very obvious one is just being able to pay gas. And any ERC twenty token, anything that has value. So if you're, if I pay you in USDC, there's no reason that I would also need to send ETH into your account um, for you to move that USDC and maybe pay your bills with it. Uh, it's it's nice if you have you know if you have an account, you whatever whatever you have of value there, um, like when you know you, someone sends you a PayPal. Um, PayPal transfer, they don't have to send you like some other PayPal tokens so you can move, you know, your US dollars in PayPal to somewhere else. Um, so payment becomes a lot easier. Um, but also, you know, maybe you're participating in, in, in uh, some governance and uh, the, the governance of that project doesn't want you to have to think whether it's worth your while to pay the gas for the interaction or not. Um, so they just decide to subsidize that. Um, or you could maybe, you know, you have some allotment, and if you go beyond the allotment, you have to pay in the in that uh, project's tokens. The nice thing about being able to interact with uh, with a blockchain without needing ETH is it also has some pri privacy bonuses. So because if you go through the usual KYC process, someone knows who you are and there are companies that are dedicated to linking all the information. Uh, together, um, so you don't have privacy. But um, yeah, that would that would be that wouldn't be an issue if you can just um, uh, receive payment in any token and also pay for the gas in any token. 
Um, because let's say I'm a contractor and I work online for you um, and I'm pseudonymous. I do the work, I give you an address, you pay me, and you know I would be able to pay my bills with that or, or, or buy something online or whatever. And I would need to also acquire ETH. Um, and I could also separate, let's say I'm working with, with different customers, I could give each of them a separate address and the customers wouldn't necessarily need to, like, they, they don't need to peek into my bank account or my equivalent of bank account and see like how much I'm making and what is the balance there. That's like we're, we're doing that um, and maybe some of us have gotten used to it, but it's really weird where you're working for someone and you, you give them the, the, like the number of your bank account and they can see exactly what's going on there. Um, that's, that's not very private. Um, and, and once we have, once we have gas abstraction as a built in feature, then we don't have, really have to worry about that anymore because we could just generate, easily generate new addresses for, for, uh, everyone that we interact with if we wanted to. There's also an interesting, um, interesting, uh, use case for enabling cross chain operations. There are many ways to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just something that becomes a lot easier once once you once you have um, uh, this functionality built into the protocol. Um, there's also there's also uh, some savings that you get from from just being able to batch uh, different transactions together. Um, also, from being able to guarantee that the transactions are going to execute uh, with atomicity. So, for some things. It's useful um, if everything happens together, and if everything doesn't happen together, then you don't want it to happen, um, because it, there, you know, it wouldn't make sense uh, for the transactions to execute separately. Um, and you know, whether this happens, um, whether this happens like in a gaming environment, or you know, there are some you know, like financial scenarios. I mean, imagine the simplest one would be you have to, you have to approve, you have to give some authorization to a contract to perform an action on your behalf. Um, and then, and then you want to perform, you want to give them like, you know, another transaction to actually perform the transaction. And those both need to execute together. Um, otherwise like uh, you just wasted gas. Um, and there is, there, there's, um, there's a sort of general use case that's interesting where um, you can actually uh, implement these um, uh, time time delay uh, flows. So, for example, let's say I want I want to be um, I want to be uh, uh, selling my ETH when it hits uh, five thousand, but I don't want to I don't I don't know uh, when that's going to happen. I don't want to sit in front of my computer. Um, so it would be possible for me to just pre-create the transaction, but make it conditional on certain certain things happening. Like, okay, only if the price of ETH is 5,000 or only after this time or whatever the condition is. And um, so my wallet would agree to execute and pay for the gas for that transaction and also maybe a transaction fee. And you would put that into a registry and or the registry of, of a future time delayed or event driven transactions and searchers, they would be able to monitor this registry and um, see, oh, like these are transactions that their conditions have just been, been met so they can compete on executing it for you. Um, and that opens up, that opens up a, a whole range of, of uh, interesting um, uh, use cases because now, you know, it doesn't have to be you that pulls the trigger at the exact moment the conditions are met. And if the conditions are met, um, the transaction will be executed for you by searchers and it could be time delayed. It could be based on essentially like whatever, uh, whatever the conditions make sense. Um, maybe another example would be, you know, there's an NFT series and you have to be, or I don't know, like, you, um, an event they have to subscribe to for in a certain time window. Um, Okay, so a little bit about ERC four three three seven, um, which is so um, this is the standard that uh, we have been um, working on, and 
Paul here is is the guy who implemented the the, the contracts. Um, so yeah, please, if there are any technical mistakes, correct me. Okay. So this is the first step um, towards protocol level account abstraction. The nice thing about our approach is that it doesn't require any change to the rules of consensus. So we can kind of experiment uh, for free and we don't have to solve governance um, in advance. Um, the way we're doing it is, okay, we essentially create a mempool, a new type of mempool um, for anyone that wants to um, participate in this. And uh, a single, you don't, you don't need more than a single network. Uh, this, this mempool, it um, uh, essentially it, it uh, accepts uh, it accepts uh, you know, something that is essentially a transaction. We're calling it user operation, but a user operation is equivalent to a transaction. But it's a it's a transaction that works with with um, with these account contracts. Um, so what that does is it makes uh, contract wallets a first class citizen. And uh, it totally does away with the need for having um, an EOA. Uh, you don't need an EOA to to control um, to control this this account. Um, and I mean the the way the way that works. Uh, maybe a, a little bit about how that works. Um, you have it, it's kind of similar to how um, uh, you know flash bots, MEV, uh, private mempools. Like the principle behind it is. You can have a mempool where bundlers, they are provided an incentive um, to submit your transaction. Um, and um, es essentially, uh, we're just, we, we took that, that idea, or originally this was Vitalik's idea, and we added the gas abstraction part to it to make it a more general purpose. And um, and then the bundlers, you know, they, their, their job is to just uh, take these user operations and eventually they, 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 they bundle them together and they submit them um, as, uh, when they're creating, when they're creating um, um, uh, bundles that, that are go to, the, uh, to actual uh, uh, blocks. Okay, the, the, um, the, the other advantage of doing things this way is that we're separating validation from execution. So um, you can have, you can have, um, so, so if, I'm, if I'm a bundler and I am paying for the gas of your transaction, there's, there's some risk involved for me because, um, you know, what happens if, the, the, you know, like if you, don't, if you don't pay me, what happens if I execute your transaction on chain and it turns out that it, um, and it ends up, uh, um, you know, um, ends up, uh, well, at the very least, you expect to be repaid in gas um, because otherwise, um, you know, why, why would you participate in the scheme? Um, so to make it, make it very safe for bundlers to participate, what we've done is we've provided um, a contract level guarantee that you're always going to be uh, paid back. Uh, regardless of of what happens with your transaction when it's executed on chain, so we've separated validation from execution, um, and what the bundler needs to do when they accept the transaction, they're just verifying that they're doing this off chain initially. Just okay, if I if I accept your transaction, um, and I'm I'm calling this view fun function, and uh, am I going to be uh, paid back uh, for the guess? That's that's all they're verifying, so it's it's pretty cheap for them to do that. And um, later, uh, totally separately, when the transaction is submitted, it gets executed. But by then, you don't really care um, as a bundler, um, even if it reverts. It's your problem, just like with a normal transaction, because you're still going to get paid. And the the you know without this, it wouldn't really be possible to um, um, to create. Uh, a permissionless uh, pool of bundlers that are participating in in this um, protocol, because the bundlers would have to trust that um, they're not going to get cheated. Just one, uh, we, we use the term bundler, 
which are a node validators, just like any node validator, that also support uh, account abstraction. And not, one of them is enough to run a network. The more they are, the network is more uh, resi resilient to uh, censorship and uh, other things. But yep. a bundler eventually, and eventually all validators, hopefully, will be also bundlers. Right, so the right now we have, so exactly, you don't need a consensus chain, you don't need like 51% um, uh, of, of validators uh, participating in this scheme because ultimately you're generating just uh, um, regular legal blocks um, and we have we have Nethermind um, as as an implementation uh, that is supporting this. Um, the more the more clients support this, the faster um, your transactions are going to get executed. But um, yeah. Okay. So so with ERC four three three seven, then you know once we have this scheme, um, we can also use it to make uh, uh, rollups. Uh, cheaper because you can batch transaction, you can aggregate signatures. So, um, so yeah, that that's that's another advantage. And like I said, doesn't require any protocol changes. So on any EVM chain, um, you can we can start experimenting with this. Is there anything you want to add? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, technically, we. Uh, a bundler can run as a separate uh, entity. It is much, much better for it to be a node to be uh, more resilient. So the way to add it right now, the way we're currently adding it on Gurley because it's still on test, is adding it as a separate server. Uh, the wallets don't care its implementation. In order to be highly scalable and to be able to batch more, it has to be a, a node in the network. Nethermind already have a node that can run uh, on Nethermind. And there's a work to add it uh, also with a uh, get code. So what's what's next? Well, yes, we can start experimenting and have um, account abstraction and any EVM compatible chain without consensus changes. But the goal is to do away with EOAs. Eventually, we don't we don't need EOAs, and uh, we know we're going to have to move away from them um, eventually at some point. Um, and there are various ways of, of thinking about this. Um, so we want to want to want to have um, account abstraction um, as a basic feature of the protocol, but we want to do it in a way that doesn't enshrine any particular wallet or gives an unfair advantage to any particular wallet. Um, and because the EOAs are a fact, and they're very very common. Um, and they probably will be um, until we, uh, you know, we move away from them, um, and will take a few years. We need a way to convert EOAs seamlessly um, to smart smart contracts. So there will be there will be some default implementation where, uh, yes, everything in the future is an abstract account, including EOAs. But if you haven't upgraded your EOA, if you haven't inserted code into your EOA, if you haven't like activated it in some way, then it just, you know, behind the scenes um, continues behaving like an EOA, EOA, but it, it has um, it has the, um, um, the the functionality requiring, uh, the, allowing you to, to upgrade it. Of course, this would require a consensus change. And there, there are various ways this it can be achieved. We're um, we're discussing. Um, you know, one way would be there's we create a new transaction type, and then you can set the code for your EOA. This is this is um, this is now the code that's running your EOA. Um, or you know, there's also a, been been um, a suggestion um, uh, EAP thirty seventy four. Maybe that in combination with another EAP, uh, we could also set uh, default proxy contract for all addresses. Um, do you want to add anything? Yeah, by, by default, that basically two options. One of them to let a user decide the exact point of time where he wants to upgrade its EOA into a, a contract wallet, either using a transaction type or new uh, opcode or, or such. Uh, the other way is to decide that at one point of time, uh, all EOAs start using some default implementation we've deployed and tested 
uh, thoroughly before, which behaves exactly like an EOA. So all users will not notice a difference, except that from now they have a way to uh, modify, to replace the uh, actual implementation. So they have a smart contract that just behaves exactly like an EOA until they decide otherwise, right? Yes. The basic contract doesn't offer any of the uh, advanced features we uh, described earlier, except the one feature, which is replace implementation. The user can replace implementation. Once it is replaced, the sky's the limit. Yeah, all, which all are the, the use data. cases yeah. that we've, all yeah. The use cases and uh, all the use cases that other people will uh, try to find. Okay. Okay, I think that is, if anyone has a question. Well, we, we still, uh, now we're gonna talk about, well, how do you join this? Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how do you join this count abstraction revolution? Um, you can start experimenting with ERC4337 right away. And at ETH Bogota, we had uh, eight wonderful submissions. Um, and uh, this is something that's um, you know already working. Um, so you don't have to wait. Um, you can add useful features like the one we did discussed, you know, batching or key recovery, um, or any any of the things that that uh, we've been talking about. You could build features that were totally not possible with EOAs that we haven't thought about. And if you do, if, you, if you're building anything cool, um, then you should definitely apply for an EF grant because we wanna see this, uh, we wanna see this um, uh, used um, and, um, and adopted and we wanna see the experimentation and wanna update this presentation with more interesting use cases. Um, so definitely uh, apply for an EF grant if you have a a cool idea that builds um, on ERC, on the CRC. Um, the other thing is, if you are building a DAP, you have to think about a future where contract wallets are first class citizens. I mean, contract wallets are already pretty common, especially uh, for teams. Um, you know, multi-sigs are an example, but still many DAPs assume that they're going to be interacting with an EOA and that, that is just um, uh, an obstacle for us to move forward. Um, it means your DAP already can't interact with things like the Gnosis Safe Wallet. Um, if you're assuming you're making assumptions such as, um, you know, the, 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 like, you know, the, how, how signatures are validated. So there are easy ways to make your DAP compatible, both with smart contracts right away and account uh, abstract accounts in the future. And that's ERC uh, 1271, which just, it checks, um, it checks if the caller has code and then there's a mechanism where it can just invoke, uh, invoke a function and instead of uh, assuming that there's, they can rely on this ECDSA key. The other one is, it, if you can, if you can um, benefit from batching in your user interface, um, and many many DApps, especially games, can, then you should check if you're connected uh, to a contract wallet that supports it, um, and that will that will uh, create a better experience for your users. It will save uh, gas costs. The other thing is um, with how gas is paid. So if you have a DApp. You should think about uh, different types of uh, gas payment models. I mean, you know, big, uh, an easy example is if you have a token, then it makes sense perhaps that your users should be able to pay uh, for the transactions in your token when you're using your DAP. Um, and if you don't have a token or you want to subsidize uh, your users, uh, that's easily accomplished um, with with uh, uh, with account abstraction. Um, you, you 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 set up yeah, you, you know you set up a a contract that authorizes to reimburse your users for whatever criteria you feel comfortable with. Maybe the onboarding process. Maybe they uh, they have to perform uh, some action, but. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's possible now. 
and a lot of the a lot of the improvements that we're going to get for for DAP usability is going to also require some you know, wallet support. So uh, wallets are an important part um, of uh, of usability for DApps, and as a DApp developer, you have some influence by collaborating with wallet devs, saying, "Okay, this is." This is something that you know would would be beneficial for my use case, um, and you can you can uh, have a have a bit of an influence by just saying, okay, this is this is useful for me. Uh, I need this feature in the wallet, um, for example, supporting account abstraction. So. Uh, other than talking with us, um, we're happy to help anyone that's implementing uh, different use cases. We do have an SDK up uh, later. Yav will share on his Twitter um, the the links. But there's there's um, there's an SDK. There's an SDK. Or you can come up to us and we'll give you. Yeah, or we'll just give you. But I can. I think. I think I can just like open this right now and show like where this is pointing to. Wait, this is very small. Why is it so small? Yeah, yeah. So we have our SDK. It's on GitHub. ETH Infinitism Account Abstraction. It's not the SDK. It's the contract. Oh, but where's the SDK? ETH Infinitism Bundler. Okay. Oh, this the link is broken. Then all right, we'll fix that. Thank you. Yeah. Infinitism. Okay. Oh, this this is the SDK. Yes. <laughs> okay. This is the reference implementation of a bundler, a simple bundler, and the SDK. Oh, cool. Package. Okay. So that's the SDK. We will fix the link later. Um, you can also read up on the ERC um, and oh, maybe that's the right link. No, no, that's that's for the uh, yeah. That's the ERC itself. Yeah, yeah, that's the ERC itself. So you can read the ERC. It's very detailed. Uh, but you can get very precise understanding of how it works. There's also a discussion on the Ethereum Magicians uh, forum, and and of course, um, it's nice to be able to talk with people. So we have a Discord, uh, we have a Discord server, and uh, you're very welcome to join and ask questions. And uh, even after this event, like if there's something that you don't get to ask us in person. Um, and yeah, maybe now we will just take some questions. Yeah. Yes, over there. The, okay. The, the in terms of development roadmap, what we've developed are the interfaces and the core contract that performs this magic. We call it entry point. It was audited, but then it was extensively modified to support uh, L2s. That is not yet audited. We still have some work on it. Uh, the API probably won't change, so a wallet will be able to work. So it's not deployment, deployed on mainnet, only on testnet uh, currently. But you can create and uh, start experimenting with wallets on top of that. The interface of a wallet, the change a wallet needs will be it's quite minimal. I can go through it adding a single method or two. Uh, yeah, we have a sample. Uh, if, uh, yeah, we have a sample that uses that adds account abstraction support to Gnosis Safe. You add a module and you basically get, make a, okay a single owner uh, Gnosis Safe and account abstracted uh, compatible. Um, so yes, you can create, and there are some work on uh, creating wallets uh, today. Uh, in terms of applications, yes, it's chicken and egg. Application needs a wallet in order to work. There is a way, no. It's for a basic for a hackathon. An application can work without a wallet, but uh, it's not something that you want, your user want to sign blindly a hash. If you're good with that, it's also possible to with uh, an application can work with account abstraction even today. The way gas abstraction works is that when you submit a user op, uh, said the contract itself validates itself, the signature and the, uh, it's nonce and in order to uh, accept the uh, request, but there's also a pointer to what we call a paymaster. A paymaster is a contract that before submitting the transaction has a chance to uh, decide whether it agrees to pay or not. If it says okay, that is, it doesn't revert, uh, 
it will use its own uh, balance, its own stake, and everything, uh, to pay for this transaction. Now, what this paymaster does on chain depends on the paymaster. So, the most obvious example of a paymaster is that the validation will be: I will check that this user has a balance of enough die and has approval from me to use this die, and I will grab enough die to cover this transaction. So, and at the end, I will refund it with the uh, excess. So. Eventually, I pay, the user pays with tokens uh, for the transaction. This is most, uh, it's the most obvious use case of a paymaster, but there are other use cases. If you want a voting dApp and you don't want the user to pay anything, okay. So the check is that the user is eligible to vote. If a user is eligible to vote and didn't vote yet, I agree to pay. It's an ex another example of a paymaster. Other examples are still uh, open. You can write whatever you like. So just just to contrast, right now if you're using Gnosis Safe, then someone on your someone on your team has to like pay the Go ETH from their account. account. Right? Even if the Gnosis Safe has plenty of ETH, um, someone still needs to like pay from their own account just to have that transaction uh, uh, finalized. Um, so with account abstraction, that wouldn't be necessary. Uh, your account will be able to pay for yourself, and this doesn't require a paymaster. But let's say you're 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 safe. For um, going back to the Gnosis Safe example, if a Gnosis Safe um, doesn't hold any ETH, or doesn't hold sufficient ETH, or you don't want to have to care about the balance and continually like exchanging and topping it off, then whatever you have uh, a balance of, assuming it's enough to pay for the gas, um, you would essentially include in your transaction a reference to something we're calling a token paymaster. And a token paymaster can be a completely autonomous contract on chain that it just um, it accepts tokens. It, and it, it would pay for the transaction in ETH and then it would settle in some way. So well, an old reference like an older reference implementation recreated with just using swap using Uniswap in that single transaction, which was kind of expensive. There are cheaper ways of doing it. But just to, it's like very simple. In one single atomic transaction, it gets paid. It gets an, a sort of um, um, an allowance in whatever token you have. It pays for the gas. It charges the transaction fee, um, and then it gives you back the the remaining uh, tokens. So with account abstraction, if you want to use if you want to use that, for example, then you would just include all oh, the. Um, the entity that is paying for the gas is a token paymaster, but there is a way for the token paymaster, you know, to to receive a commitment from your account to pay it back. So it's not just subsidizing the transaction; though that's also possible. It makes it possible. Right now, you have to split it because of a different concern. If you need some corporate level security using a say, Gnosis Safe, and if you want a game, you will use MetaMask, and if you use a private, you use Trezor. Now, if you uh, if you want them all in a single address, yes, you will be able to do it with account abstraction. Probably, you, you still might have multiple abstracted accounts for different purposes, but for, for different reasons. If, if the reason to have multiple addresses is only security, then yes, you will be able to use an abstracted account uh, to find something that can uh, cover all, uh, all bases. Yeah, because you can just limit your risk exposure uh, to each device, depending on how much you trust it. Again, I'm not saying that there will be one wallet that will give you all these use cases. You'll find a wallet that give you all the use cases you need uh, and use that. And you always can switch. I think the, ba the, the, the first use case of a signature is chain signature. Just think of it, you start using MetaMask, and after a few years, you collected a lot of NFTs and a lot of money, but you can't change the security model. Your browser holds your private key, so you have no idea if anyone hacked into your computer and grabbed it through a copy of your computer. Without changing the address, you can't change the security. With account abstraction, with single operation of change owner. Now, the trees are on the same account. Even if with the basic, simple account, I just changed the owner, and now I am really secured because the previous uh, private key is no longer relevant. Yeah, even before you get into the really fancy stuff that you can do with the abstract, um, account abstraction, the basics are actually pretty um, pretty useful just by themselves because right now, if anything goes wrong, 
then it's really hard to transfer everything from, from one EOA to another. I mean, you would have to create separate uh, transactions for each asset that you hold. That could be pretty expensive. Um, and if your computer got compromised, you might need to do that in a huge hurry. You know, so it's it's um, it's just not not the best situation to be in. Even very simple improvements like this will make a big difference.